The NBA draft is here. The Arizona Coyotes are pulling the plug. The Chiefs are getting the hallmark treatment, and we're getting a look into the state of NIL today on the cusp of college athletes getting paid directly. It's Wednesday, June 26th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The NBA draft is upon us. Joining me now to discuss is front office sports breaking news and enterprise reporter Alex Schiffer. Welcome, Alex. What's going on, Owen? Been a minute. Yeah, it has. How you been? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, yeah. Hanging in there. Um, <clears throat> so the NBA draft is coming. Um, uh, it's going to be a two-night thing. You will be there in Brooklyn at the Barclays Center. Uh, will you be watching for in terms of the ambiance, the scene, You know, things you're hoping to observe or find out? What's What are you looking for? Yeah, I think just to start off, I'll be kind of curious about attendance, given that it's a down draft from last year. Talent-wise, there's no Victor Webanyama type guy. Uh, a lot of international guys in this draft, especially at the top with some French guys led by Alex Saar. So how many locals turn out? You know, what's attendance look like between the not just the, the talent drop-off, per se, but also the, the lack of local guys with, with buzzy names? Maybe Donovan Klingon is the biggest, you know, quote-unquote local guy who's from Connecticut. Um, I have a friend who got tickets for 20 bucks and is trying to find people to go with him. So I'm kind of curious based on the factors I just listened in the text I just got, like, uh, like about that. And honestly, I sound like a reporter here more than anything, but like just how quickly are we out of there? You know, the past drafts I've covered if, with the two rounds, you're going to maybe two, three in the morning, depending upon the team you cover and what goes down, you know, they, they broke this up to maybe make it a bit easier to watch. So are we out of there by 11? Is this wrapped up by before midnight? Like, I, I think... I think if it goes late, then uh, then there's some question of like, well, why not, why not just continue to knock out the whole thing? If it's going to be a late night, make it one late night instead of two. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, certainly as a television product, you're you're better off two nights because, yeah, how many people are, you know, still up at 1 a.m. to watch, you know, who goes 43rd in the second round? Um, how do you think the two night thing is the first time we're doing this? How do you think that's going to affect the draft itself? It's going to be interesting. You know, I, I think in some ways this works well for the year to be the two night approach, even though there's not a big name because th maybe the biggest name in the draft, even though he's not the best prospect, is Bronny James. And there is a good chance that he is on the board going into round two. So does that help viewership? Does that keep eyeballs maybe going into the late first round uh, when maybe some people are starting to check out a little bit? That is a curiosity of mine in terms of does Bronny help the ratings and, and what would they look like without him in a, in a world in which we can't see, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I'll certainly be more curious um, for that second day just because, you know, I, I know some of these players, but by round two, you're kind of getting to the point where if you're a real college basketball fan or you're a big, big NBA fan, you probably still know most of those people. But uh, more casual fans saying, OK, you know, like, see who my team gets and then, you know, read read the write up on them. Uh, but, yeah, with the Bronny question out there, it's there's just that extra layer of intrigue. He'll probably go to the Lakers with uh, it's the last pick of the draft, right? The, it's, that there's they get 58 them and... picks this year. Two picks were taken away by teams who, who broke the rules on stuff. I think tampering Lakers pick 55. OK, so, yeah, right, right at the end, kind of the logical spot. Maybe someone jumps the line in the hopes of getting LeBron. But, yeah, it's funny how we have this player who might not even get drafted if he were Bronny Jones. But because he's Bronny James, um, you know, there's there's so much attention around him. Um, uh, how do you think the, the new CBA is going to um, affect how teams operate? Because we're, we're, you know, we're very much in a shifting landscape here. That, to me, could be the story of the draft, depending upon what happens, you know, the Minnesota Timberwolves are maybe the most interesting team in the NBA in that they are fresh off a of Western Conference Finals appearance. They're very young. They have an ownership battle going on right now between Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez against Glenn Taylor, which we've covered extensively at front office sports uh, company plug there. But, um, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of question about like a guy like Carl Towns, um, who does he get traded because his extension that starts out at like 50 million a year is about to kick in and with the new aprons and the tax penalties you know you could break his contract into a couple players if you're the Timberwolves um 
there was some idea of Paul George maybe getting traded. If, if he doesn't want to stay with the Clippers, does he opt in his player option and then get traded and maybe work out a new deal at his new home? Um, those things to me could be the could really dominate the draft if we start to see movement on those fronts. Are teams that are coming up on that second apron or first apron and losing some of the you know the the taxpayer and mid level exceptions and all those types of things you know the the um, buyouts as well. You know, do we start to see teams that just say this is getting to be too much and now's the time we pull the trigger on this and and maybe not hit the reset button but like the uh, reload or uh or i forget it's not a rebuild but a uh i'm, I'm forgetting the sports term here but not a total rebuild <laughs> but uh reshaping or whatever something with yeah, yeah. anyway mm-hmm. yeah i i to me the biggest thing that could happen tomorrow night is someone who we never heard of going number one that's not alex star donovan Klingon, one of those guys or like a big star getting traded that really shakes up the landscape of the league yeah, and the two night thing could interact with that too, because you know maybe a team gets a player they weren't expecting on day one, and uh, and then you know that that makes them swing a trade on on day two or keep a player they were were thinking of letting go, but they've got you know a night to think about it um, that they didn't have before. It was all just kind of now it's like one a.m. you know in previous years, and you're like okay, it would sort of make sense for us to maybe trade one of these picks or something or like try to swing a big deal, but. You know, it's, how, how are we going to throw that together with another totally frazzled team in the next half hour? So, um, so yeah, the, maybe we'll see some some fun action there. Yeah, definitely curious on that. You know, it's interesting. Another thing I kind of wonder about with the, the one night in between the two rounds is some of those second round picks that are especially kind of after 45 in the back end of them. Um, you kind of have the option to get drafted. You know, I mean, obviously a team can submit your name and that's that. But, you know, a lot of guys who I covered over the years have said how, you know, they had like that were undrafted free agents, had the option to get drafted, but they rather decided to go the undrafted free agent round to kind of pick their place. So I'm kind of curious if we see maybe a, a change in thinking or if there's someone on the board that um, that is surprising you at some point. Does that they just go the undrafted route after a certain pick? Um you know, you look at teams like the Miami Heat who've had like a really good track record of, of undrafted guys and whatnot. I'm, I'm kind of curious if you see camps maybe switch their approach. All right, if a guy, to your point, like if a guy was going to be like a mid-second round pick or high second round pick and then it turns out that they're off the board early or, they, or um, someone else is off the board early, um, do you maybe see a guy who was projected to get drafted in the mid-40s um, or, or a little higher say, you know what, I'm going to go the undrafted route? So. We might not know that immediately. It might be years later we learn that stuff if they become a big deal and they say that in a story. But uh, I'll be curious to see if, if we see a change in thinking, with, to your point, with teams or players on this front uh, with, the new, with the new broadcast. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that's the, the other big part of this is like the salary cap is about to – I mean, it's going to go up 10% per year for a long time. I'm not, not sure how yes. many years, but, yeah, it's it, it's – you know, maybe going to double like over the next, you know, six, seven years, uh, or I guess it would take a little longer than that, but it, it's, it's, yeah, the salaries are about to get huge and some teams are going to take different approaches with that. Yeah. One thing to kind of piggyback off your comment, you know, there's all, because of the salary cap and the media rights deal and stuff like that, there's already talk of how Victor Wembanyama could become like the uh, billion dollar player when it's all said and done because of what the super maxes would be. You know, the same goes for a lot of the guys in this draft. So like, are we talking, yeah. depending upon how things shake out, of one of them being, you know, one of the first uh, NBA billion dollar guy in career earnings or, or some astronomical number we've never seen before. Yeah. And I, I bet some teams will try to sign those guys early, uh, you know, lock in their, their salary uh, so that, you know, they get some prime years um, at a, a guaranteed price instead of a, uh, you know, price that, that could get into like 50, 60, $70 million once, once this, yeah, you know, the yeah. media, new media deal starts doing its thing. It's not a, uh, it's not a uh, crazy conception that a guy taken in this draft will at some point be getting paid a million dollars per game, depending yeah. upon <laughs> what, uh, what, whenever that stage of that career that would be. But to your point, based on the projected salary cap increases, the media right deals, um, the way it's been increasing already, um, you know, I think the high. I think Steph Curry's the highest paid guy in the league right now. At hold on, um, it's making around fifty million. You know, yeah. Like so he's so you do the math of um of of that and what he's already kind of getting per game right now. It's not that 
hard to conceive a guy that gets taken in this draft will be getting paid a million dollars per game and be on some deal that pays it at least 82 million a season. Yeah. At, yeah. Again, I'm not saying that we're going to see this in 2027, but at some point in their career. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Good gig. If you can get it, Alex Schiffer, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Owen. The Arizona coyotes are giving up their quest to reactivate the franchise. Alex Morello is walking away from his ownership of the team and ending his attempts to build a new arena, according to PHNX Sports. Morello had put all of his chips on a land auction that was set for this Thursday, but as we covered on Monday's show, that was canceled because the team did not obtain the required permit to build an arena there. The team reportedly knew this was likely going to be an issue, but felt that they had to go for it anyway because the right to start a new franchise in the Phoenix area came with a timeline that included benchmarks along the way, and one of those was to have a concrete plan in place by the end of the 2023-24 NHL season. The permit they would have needed to can take 8-10 to 10 months to acquire. The decision ends years of arena-related issues, which forced them to play in the 5,000-capacity mullet arena at Arizona State University for the last two seasons, and also included a failed public vote that would have allowed them to build in Tempe. Since moving to the area in 1996, the Coyotes have had as many venues as playoff series wins. While Morello appears to be done with the NHL, Phoenix might not be. Whenever the league expands, the market will be near the top of the list as long as a new ownership group can get all the ingredients together. The Kansas City Chiefs season had kind of a rom-com feel to it with a star player dating the world's biggest pop star, his lovable sidekick brother cheering him on from the suites, and a Super Bowl win that came together on some fluky plays. Now the team is making the leap into an actual Hallmark movie. Hallmark Media, Skydance Sports, the NFL, and the Chiefs are collaborating on a Christmas movie titled Holiday Touchdown, A Chiefs Love Story. The movie will start production in July and be filmed entirely in Kansas City, including Arrowhead Stadium. While the publicity around the movie has focused on how the Chiefs and Hallmark are both based in Kansas City, the more significant tie-up may be between the NFL and Skydance, who teamed up on a new production studio in November 2022. The film will not revolve around the romance between a tight end and a pop star. Rather, it will focus on a woman whose family is a finalist for the Chiefs Fan of the Year contest, who spends a lot of time with the team's director of fan engagement, and there seems to be some chemistry there. But things go sideways when her grandfather's lucky Chiefs hat goes missing, You'll have to watch the movie to see how it all works out. Personally, I think the missing hat thing is just going to be too much to overcome. Okay, I'm joined now by Chloe V. Mitchell, founder of Playbooked, and Trey Holder, president of Brand Innovator Sports. Welcome, Chloe. Welcome, Trey. Awesome. Thanks Thank for you. Us Great to have you both. So, Chloe, we'll start you with you. You were a college volleyball player at the moment that it became legal for college athletes to profit off their NIL rights. What was your thought process at that time? At that moment in time, I'm going to be honest, I was excited, but also very frazzled. So because I played at the NAIA level, we were not expecting the legislation to pass when it did. So I got a call after practice, sweaty. It was a, I actually distinctly remember it was a conditioning day. And I got in my car to go back to my dorm. And all of a sudden, I just got a call. And it was Chloe. NIL is legal it's time to do what we do best. And so Playbooked was an infant at the time. So I took my deal from Playbooked, went home, executed, posted, and now we're here, Owen. Yeah, and what was Playbooked pre-NIL? Playbooked pre-NIL was a hope. It was a hope that we would honestly have what we, we do today, which is thousands of athletes onboarded onto the platform with brands looking to spend money on these captivating athletes that have the engagement and influence that these brands are looking for. Yeah. So, so you guys essentially have a, a platform, right, for, yeah, for athletes to find, you know, to be able to monetize them, their, their brands. Yes. And, and Trey, let's bring you in here. So if you could just First, give us some orientation around what is Brand Innovator Sports and, and how do you work with Playbooked and, and every, you know, basically, yeah, what, what you guys are up to here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Brand Innovators is actually the largest community of marketers in the world. It's been around for 13 years. Uh, we do about 250 days of content a year where marketers come and share ideas through fireside chats, panels, etc. cetera. Uh, we've been doing events uh, for probably the last five to seven years around Super Bowl um, NBA draft, all-star game, U.S. Open, et cetera. Um, I had built a business with Brand Innovators about eight years ago, and they basically came to me because I'm a huge college sports fan and said, hey, you, you, 
never stop talking about college sports, we have a lot of brands that are trying to figure out how to navigate this new space. Uh, would you come you know, be the president of our sports platform um, and help us continue to develop that platform, help the brands navigate the space and start doing things around college? Uh, that took me probably less than an hour to say yes to. And uh, <laughs> uh, honestly, in my heart, I said yes. I did do my research. And when I did my research, quite candidly, I thought, you know, there's so much misinformation out there. Um, I know a lot of brands and retailers, and they don't really understand it. And that's what our community does. It really, um, you can think about how, many, how much marketing changes, how dynamic it is, and how those marketers have to have a pulse on everything happening across all platforms. And uh, I thought this is perfect for brand innovators. So we started the college journey with brand innovators, you know, shortly after, which is probably about seven months ago. And that's when I ran into Chloe and her founders, and uh, they quickly became kind of the first partners of our college uh, football or college sports, rather, platform. And I want to get this from from both of your ends, from like the marketers and the athletes side of things. What are those big misconceptions around NIL? You know, as you know, we're it's still a very young space. So, yeah, what, where are people kind of going astray here? Yeah, I can jump oh, in. Oh, where do we start with this one, yeah, Trey? You want me to start? Are you going to start? <laughs> well, basically what I figured out oh, and, and take it away. which I really thought was, was interesting is, you know, I talked to several CMOs and marketers and they'd say, oh, we, we were going to do this deal with, you know, said college. And, uh, but it was a seven figure deal for two athletes. And, and I thought that doesn't sound right to me. I mean, I know what NIL is from a fundraising collective perspective. That's very different than what the true nature of NIL is supposed to be, uh, where brands are working through, through true name, image, and likeness. And what we were finding out is that people were, you know, there's a lot of people in the middle and they're all trying to get theirs. And the reality of it is you can go directly to those athletes and work with them through an organization like Playbook, and it's not cost prohibitive. So I think that's one thing. And I think the other thing that brands were most scared of is they don't have a history of working with these athletes. And so everybody imagines themselves if, hey, what was I going to do at 18 years old with all this money? What kind of mistakes would I make? And so I think that was nerve wracking for a lot of uh, a lot of these marketers. And they'd say to themselves, well, I know I can work with a pro athlete that has you know, 10 years of history and I know what they're going to do. And, um, and that's when I was really excited to meet the Playbook group because they really mitigate a lot of that risk for those brands. And so those were the first things that I saw and Chloe, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just going to reaffirm what Trey said in a little bit of different words. So essentially it's, I have a twofold answer. One, it's cost prohibitive because the brands see these headlines that millions of dollars are poured into one athlete or like Trey said, a seven figure deal for two athletes. And we've had many meetings with managers and agents that immediately say, oh no, that is, that is just for publicity. That is just for the press. Essentially, brands think it's cost prohibitive and athletes think it's too daunting to even delve into said NIL space because they're not these top one percenters. So you don't have to be a top one percenter performer on and off the court to make money um, with name image likeness. And on top of that, you don't have to be a fortune 500 brand to participate in the NIL space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm curious about, yeah, the sort of two through a hundred percent, um, how much of your NIL brand is, I mean, is just a function of your social media presence? Um, like, can you be, can you make a lot of money in NIL if, if you're like in the sort of low thousands or even the hundreds of social media followers? It depends on your definition of a lot of money. So if you are an athlete, we like to call them nano or micro influencers, you can make great money doing name image likeness campaigns, which it can range from a couple hundred dollars per post to maybe even pushing a thousand dollars per post. And that is, I'm just talking 5,000 to 10,000 followers, maybe even less. But when you do have that macro influence, that larger following, it does make NIL deals potentially something that you can live on. If you are doing the right things as a content creator and an athlete, and that's something we love to do at Playbook is educate and foster long-term brand relationships. So it's definitely a balance. What do you think, Trey? Yeah, I would say, look, if you are, uh, 
you know, if you're Chloe V. Mitchell and you have 3.2 million followers, that's always going to be a big positive. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'll tell you what I'd say is interesting. If it's during the NCAA tournament, you're going to see, you know, you'll see like real live commercials, the turbo, turbo tax deals, you know, those kinds of things. And a lot of those athletes really point. don't have many followers at all, uh, but they're on TV all mm-hmm. the time. So they know they're going to get those impressions. And it's interesting, um, you know, I won't say the athlete or the college, but, you know, we had an organization reach out and they wanted to work with one athlete because that athlete had more followers, but the other athlete actually has a bigger name and is a top player in NCAA women's mm-hmm. basketball. And they wanted the first athlete, not the second athlete, even though we, even though the first athlete is, had, it wasn't on brand for her. And we always talk about authenticity and we probably talk about that late, later here. And Chloe always speaks to that, but they didn't want the bigger name because they didn't think that that bigger name had a better social following. Um, and anyway, I just right. found that really interesting. Although that bigger name had done real commercials on real TV during the NCAA. So I think it's what the brand wants a little bit as well and what their goals are. And if the brand has a big social media goal and following themselves, then they're probably going to want a big social media following. We're just a few years into NIL being legal for college athletes. Um, yeah, and in those early days, like there was just like a lot of like novelty to it, um, a lot of like very random deals that we saw. Um, I'm wondering how you've seen it change. Like, has does it feel kind of more streamlined and like people kind of know what they're doing a little bit more? Or are we still pretty much in the Wild West? I mentioned this in our Us Weekly article. In the beginning, it felt like I was juggling chainsaws on a unicycle on a tightrope over a pool of sharks. It was absolutely insane. And the chainsaws were endorsement deals and campaign briefs. And the unicycle was me trying to balance life, school, sport, content creation, etc. That is because it was the wild, wild west, like you said. Nowadays, there are so many tools and resources and education that can be given to an athlete to make their life not only easier, but doable. NAL is doable. It's not for everyone, but if you want to learn how to do it, resources, again, like Playbooked. I'm a co-owner in the company, so of course I'm a little biased and I'm going to talk about it a lot. If I had playbooked as playbooked is now, it would have been a different story for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the and, <laughs> yeah. And, and um, you know, what, what do you think the college athlete experience is now? You know, if, if you've got something of a following, maybe you're not like the top top, but like you can make some money. Is it, you know, you kind of like sign up through a platform and, you know, let people know you're available and things just kind of go from there or uh, like, how much do you have to be an entrepreneur? How much can you just kind of like say like, oh, I'm interested and people find you? So the beauty of NIL is it can be as big as you want it to be. If you are going to pour your time and effort, similar to playtime, if you're going to pour your time and effort and get the reps in and be there early before practice and be the last one to leave, you're going to see the fruits of your labor. You're going to get the playtime. You're going to get the brand deals. I, that's not a promise. But it is saying if you hone your craft, you're going to be better at it. And the same goes with NIL. So So this is still... 10,000 hours, right? Go ahead, Trey. I was just going to say... Yeah, 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 exactly, Trey. 10,000 hours, right? If you're going to... You got to get the reps in. And and I will just kind of lean into what she said earlier. I do think that... Look, there's still a little bit of Wild West out there just because of what's happening with the settlements and everything that's going on right now. That being said... Um, I do believe the most important piece is the education piece on both sides, right? It's educating the athletes how to be creators. And I think it's a constant education of the brands on how to work with these athletes and why they should work with those athletes. You know, one of the things that we had a panel in, um, at Papa John's here this last week and, and the University of Georgia had um, Asia Avenger, uh, the point, their point guard, one of the coolest names ever, by the way. Um, and, and another gentleman who plays for the basketball team. And we were talking about, um, you know, what, what's happening, you know, out there. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, getting in front of these brands and, and letting that, their faces being in front of the brands and the brands actually seeing how polished these individuals are sitting on the panels and talking about their futures and goals. I just think it's, it's super important. And so the more, 
we can feature, you know, these athletes so that these brands can see how they operate. I just think that's really important. That's a great point, Trey. And yeah, you, you mentioned the, the house settlement that I think is still not completely, a, yeah, everyone signed off on it yet, but it, pretty soon um, universities will be able to pay their athletes directly. And a lot of NIL deals um, up to this point have essentially been that, you know, saying you'll, we'll, you'll get a bunch of money for doing some events and, and you'll be our star quarterback and you'll, you'll make X number of million dollars doing that. With that piece just kind of going straight to the athletes, maybe you know, to some degree taking out the middle people who are sort of facilitating what was kind of a pay-for-play already, I'm wondering how you think that could change NIL going forward when it's more just brand relationships. Yeah, I think I think we're going to see the rise of true NIL now, right? So it kind of we talked about it, hit on it earlier in the podcast is NIL was essentially created so that these students could profit off their name, image, and likeness, right? If you go all the way back to the original lawsuit. And then what happened, though, is uh, is all these universities basically created these fundraising teams, to your point, Owen. And, you know, you go and do an event at Shriner Hospital, which is great, an amazing event. And then, you, you know, you get a quarter million dollars for it or whatever it is. All of that stuff is going in-house now, you know, the $22 million. And it'll be interesting to see how um, the schools start to try and replace that revenue. But I think you'll see a lot of collectives potentially morph into agencies, the ones that are more set that way. I think you'll see organizations like Playbook and a lot of the bigger agencies also get involved and really try to support the athletes around real brand deals. So I don't think the genie's ever going to go back in the bottle on these brand deals. I think that those will continue to be successful. And I think the universities that set up their athletes with those right third party partners are the ones that are going to have the most success. Right. And building off of that, running a mass campaign with athletes is something that not everybody is prepared to do. And at Playbook, what we specialize in is athlete marketing at scale. So we handle everything from soup, soup to nuts. We're saying, hey, the entry barrier for you brand to come into the NIL space to pour brand dollars into these athletes it's no longer there because we're gonna handle it, we're gonna help you, we're gonna walk you through it and hold your hand. We like to call it a white glove service. So again, it, it's just, I, I hope that brands are able to see, especially now that uh, universities can have a hand in what's going on, that agencies and marketing scale agencies like ours are essential to doing this the right way for the athletes and for them. And you guys are, are working together on something called the all creator team. So what's this all about? Yeah. So that was, Take it away, uh, Trey. that was a concept that we, you know, we sat down, it was over a dinner at one of our summits and thought, you know, how do we better serve these athletes? I mean, we do believe that female athletes are, are underserved. I mean, candidly, the fundraising NIL, probably 85% of it goes to the football team and then, then basketball and, you know, et cetera. It doesn't all go spread across equally um, across the different sports. And so we felt like that was one thing is we wanted to feature an underserved community. And then the second thing was, goes all the way back to what we talked about at the beginning of the podcast is how do we try to mitigate that risk for these brands to participate and feel confident participating with these athletes. And, you know, fortunately because of, you know, the brand innovators access to all the brands, we have the ability to help educate these brands. And fortunately, because I'm still, participating over at, you know, one of the largest media companies who owns us weekly and they have 40 million uniques, we can get this word out, you know, on a monthly basis, 40 million uniques. And then Chloe and her team has the ability to go out and identify these athletes. And we basically said, you know, Playbook, here's the criteria. I think we should all, we all agreed. We aligned on it and said, we want accomplished athletes, not just creators, but, you know, accomplished athletes. We want them to have a true social media following and then we want them to have worked with real Fortune 500 brands and have a great reputation working with those brands. And that's what Playbook does, right? So they went out and came back with their list of athletes. We vetted them, uh, made sure that everything was accurate. Our editorial team felt comfortable with it. And uh, we released the first one here in the fall and we or in the spring and, or summer, really. We wanted to do it in the spring, but, you know, we wanted to get it out there in print. 
and uh, and then we'll do another one in the fall. So think of this as the postseason team. Uh, this is the preseason team. So Chloe, anything you want to add to that? I could, but Owen, if you have another question, my answer might answer said question. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll give you one more, which is just um, as we kind of look toward the future, you know, I guess post house settlement, but also just like as things kind of continue to shake out and, and people sort of start to understand the space some more. Um, what are you sort of looking to to build in the NIL space going forward? I'll take this one first, Trey. I am extremely passionate about getting schools hopefully on a federal level, that would be ideal, but especially getting universities to understand the inequity in term in terms of brand dollars spent on male to female sports. I have had my finger on the pulse of NAL since its beginning and female creators, women creators are just naturally better at this. Most of our athletes that we work with through Playbooked, not by choice, just by happenstance, are female athletes that are incredible creators, very detail oriented people, not to say that men don't do incredible posts as well, but my hope is to Get some kind of legislation put in place or just the word out to brands that, hey, there is a massive inequity in NIL dollars spent from male to female sports. Massive. In fact, 82% of professional athletes, which some of these college athletes are going to proceed into professional careers, some aren't. But the 82% of women that are professional athletes have to supplement their income with other endorsement deals. Actually, I said that wrong. 82% of their income comes from endorsement deals. Mm -hmm. There we go. So I'm very passionate about that, and I hope to see change in terms of where brands are spending their money and who they're spending their money on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I would just add on our side, I mean, as mentioned, I mean, we're here to work. I mean, we really do serve the brands. That is what our community is. So anything we can do helpful with the brands, I think is super important for us. One thing I did learn to Chloe's point is the brand marketers are way more comfortable candidly working with the women for all the reasons that she mentioned. Um, you know, they, they are more natural creators and, and they um, just feel very comfortable, you know, working with them. So that's, that, that was exciting to learn and, and really interesting to learn, you know, as well. So, you know, I think our goal is to continue to highlight, uh, you know, these underserved communities and facilitate partnerships that's really what we do yes all right i'll leave it there chloe v mitchell uh, trey holder thanks so much for joining us on the show awesome. thank, thank you so you much for having, having us that's it for today make sure you're subscribed wherever you like to listen and throw us a rating or review it'll help other people find the show thanks for listening we will see you tomorrow